Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy. Welcome to One to One. Recent demonstrations in support of the Black Lives Matter movement have reignited the controversy over whether statues honoring Confederate heroes should be banished from public spaces or whether they should remain to bear witness to the country's racist past. Harold Holzer is director of Hunter College's Roosevelt House Public Policy Institute and an authority on Abraham Lincoln and the political culture of the Civil War. He once opposed removing these statues from the public square, but has recently changed his mind. What caused this change of heart? We'll also talk about his new book, The Presidents Versus the Press, the endless battle between the White House and the media from the founding fathers to fake news. It's published by Dutton, an imprint of Penguin Random House. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me, sir. The controversy over uh, statues of historic figures who have been called out as racist, um, whether they should be removed from public spaces, has been growing for quite some time. And it was reignited by the demonstrations that followed the murder of George Floyd. According to one report, as of mid-June, at least 22 cities had removed or approved the removal of Confederate monuments. Now, just three years ago, you said publicly that you did not favor this wholesale purge of Confederate monuments. Uh, but in a recent article in the Daily News, you said you have changed your mind. Tell me why your thinking about these statues has changed. Well, when, when I uh, spoke at Gettysburg, I guess three years ago, about Confederate monuments and statues generally, that I thought there was, a, there was a, uh, an argument to be made for their preservation. In the same way that, uh, you know, the Metropolitan Museum has statues of Nero and uh, uh, other horrendous figures from history, which rank as treasures um, uh, artistically. I did say at the time that I thought the most important thing was to install some sort of context for all of the Confederate statues. In other words, let's take maybe the most artistically worthy, the Robert E. Lee monument by Mercier in Richmond, which does have artistic merit. Build something nearby that would explain why this statue was installed. It wasn't installed to uh, honor the Robert E. Lee who opened a college or who took over a college in Lexington and dedicated himself to reconciliation, maybe not racial reconciliation, but sexual reconciliation. But don't let it stand there without that kind of interpretation. Well, in the three years that followed, everybody stayed with their hard and fast positions that the statue should stay, and the arguments that the statues should leave on the other side. And I've done a lot of programming um, over the last three years with scholars that I respect and friends. And I think I just, after the George Floyd murder, I just felt that it wasn't worth it, that, uh, that Black Lives Mattered more than the life of inanimate objects that after all were built in the Lost Cause era, in the era of Jim Crow, to remind people of color, even in cities where they lived, that they were second-class citizens, that the South would rise again, that the ethos of white supremacy would reign on high pedestals. And I think I just came to the conclusion that it wasn't worth fighting for artistic merit when these statues could be moved out of the public square and maybe into museums where they could be given the context that they need. It does seem that the whole George Floyd incident um, has, has re really been a seminal in, uh, event in how white people, non-black people are viewing the experience of black people in America. Was that the turning point for you? Yeah, I think it was. I think the George Floyd um, murder, um, and the outpouring of black and brown and white people on the streets to protest, also to unify, to, um, to have a, a common purpose in really doing more than they've ever done in their lives to address systemic injustice and, and intransigent racism and just deal with it, or at least accept that it exists and that we haven't done enough. 
I just think people have reached um, people have reached a, a position where there's no going back and there's no making an argument that these symbols don't hurt people. A very dear friend of mine who is a historian at Howard University um, with whom I've had, I guess, conversations bordering on debates reminded me in one of those debates that she grew up in Richmond, a young African-American woman walking in the shadow of Lee and Jackson and Jeb Stewart and Jefferson Davis. And her poignant reminders of what it felt like to be in a public square over which loomed figures that fought for the perpetuation of slavery is just too emotionally um, convincing. Um, so I think that's why I transitioned. I guess I'm kind of sorry I didn't transition earlier, um, but there is no redeeming Confederate memorials. And indeed, Lincoln has come under, um, I guess, attack in a certain way at the University of Wisconsin and in Washington, um, where uh, a kind of ill-advised memorial called the Emancipation uh, Group um, has, has sat in Washington for 140 years and is now arousing very close scrutiny as well. So what should we do with the Confederate monuments that are in the public spaces? What should we, what should we do with them? Well, I think, I, I, you know, I worked at the Metropolitan Museum for, for more than 20 years, and I know that it's, it's easy for others to say, let's put them in museums. There are two reasons why that's hard. One is that museums are crowded and don't have space for gigantic monuments. The second reason is um, uh, statues like the Lee statue in Richmond were made to sit very high up. So they were carved um, in a very uh, deep sculptural manner. If you put them down low, it'll be like, you know, going up to a Van Gogh painting from three inches away. All you'll see are splotches of paint. You won't get the full view. So to some degree, the museum solution is not really realistic. Um, there are civil war museums that have outdoor spaces like the museum in Richmond. That's a possibility because that's a place that is designed to explore the Northern point of view, the Southern rebellion and African-American history. That's a perfect place for these statues to be studied in context and not loom as like giant gods in our faces. Mayor Landrieu in New Orleans, he certainly was a leader in this. And um, there was actually a monument in New Orleans that he took down, which celebrated something called the Liberty Place uh, Rebellion. The Liberty Place Rebellion was a race riot commenced by white citizens determined to get rid of an integrated government after the Civil War. And the fact that there was actually a monument to a rampage against people of color and progressive white people is just inexplicable and unacceptable. And Mayor Landro included that in, the, in, his, in his famous purge. But uh, other people have taken matters into their own hand. And you know, it, Hanson, it's been okay. The so-called Silent Sam statue, just a soldier at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, Students did a lot of work researching that dedication. And it was a dedication ceremony filled with racist speeches, really horrendous speeches. And there's no question that it was built as a warning to people of color in the community. And students just lost patience with the discussion and they just pulled it down. And now the university has it in storage. That's a good solution for a really bad work of art that was insulting from the moment it was dedicated in, in the or late 19th century. I don't have a great answer, Cheryl, maybe cemeteries, um, but now there's an argument about Civil War battlefields as well. So it may be that these things just have to go into storage somewhere. The debate has been not just about the Confederate monuments, but also about monuments to any public figures who might have committed um, racist acts. Uh, the statue of Dr. Marion Sims, the gynecologist who experimented on female slaves without anesthesia. I believe it was recently removed Central yeah. Park, probably rightly so. But I mean, as you mentioned, there are also other prominent figures in American history who, you know, had racist tendencies. But what do you do about uh, statues of George Washington? What do you do about Thomas Jefferson? Uh, what do you do about uh, 
Christopher Columbus. What do, what do we do about those? It's really complicated. I mean, um, Maureen Dowd wrote in a column a couple of years ago, uh, why don't we should focus in judging these memorials on the subject's main accomplishment. So with Washington and Jefferson, you could argue their main accomplishment was writing uh, and fighting for an ideal of freedom, even if they didn't practice it themselves. Um, what was Columbus's main goal? I guess it was to go to uh, India, which he sort of, there was a continent in the way that he didn't know about. Uh, Columbus, Columbus is especially complicated because he's become a symbol of Italian American progress in New York City and other major cities. And I think um, he sort of stands apart now uh, as a, uh, from his uh, misdeeds and those of his, uh, the sailors who came after him to the new world and what they did to natives people. So again, I don't have any solutions. I, happily, I just, I, I write mostly about the Civil War and I think the irredeemable ones are, are Jefferson Davis and Nathan Bedford Forrest who stood in Tennessee, there was a statue of Forrest in Tennessee for generations without anybody saying, this is a general who slaughtered African-American soldiers after they threw down their arms and surrendered. This was a, a general who was a slave trader before the Civil War. And this was a general who was the first grand wizard of the Klan. He has no place in any public square. Uh, and and he, it should never have been built and I don't think there is a, a, a reason on earth to preserve and defend them. I might add, you know, it, people are always worried about, you know, the iconoclasm. Um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a kind of a, a violent act in some ways, removing works of art. But New York, uh, this is a good thing to say on CUNY TV, New York has a, actually has a tradition of iconoclasm. In 1776, when the Declaration of Independence was read um, in Lower Manhattan on the Battery, the citizens reacted by tearing down a statue of King George III. And then they smashed it into bits and melted the lead, it was made of lead, to make bullets to fight the French. So this has been our tradition of reappraisal and rethinking these works. And it's not unhealthy in the certain way. Right, each generation decides which people from the past it wants to venerate and which ones yeah. have been not. You also criticize the sexism that's evident in who gets to have a statue, uh, certainly in New York City. Right. And yeah, uh, well, I've been saying that the, you know, the only women who are honored in Central Park are, um, are Mother Goose and Alice in Wonderland. Uh, but as we know, they're about to have um, uh, Sojourner Truth and uh, Elizabeth Cady San Stanton and Susan B. Anthony uh, as a suffragist monument in Central Park. We do have Eleanor Roosevelt in Riverside Park, but I came out in the Daily News a couple of months after, or a couple of weeks after writing about Confederate statues and kind of revived an idea that um, I talked about with ex-Mayor Ed Koch uh, 15 years ago and that was to put up a statue of Bella Abzug on her old stamping ground uh, in Washington Square Park, right near where both she and Ed Koch lived, not together, heaven knows, but they lived in the same building. And um, it was it, Bella, Bella's 100th birthday was July 24th. And I think that would be a good tribute. We're getting a Shirley Chisholm statue in Brooklyn. Governor Cuomo is really pushing new statues, Mother Cabrini, another woman who is going to be celebrated. So I think the city is moving very belatedly. And look at Statuary Hall in the Capitol. It's no better down there, aside from the fact that there are still Confederates. And aside from the fact that Nancy Pelosi had statues of pro-slavery and pro-Confederacy speakers removed uh, from the speakers gal uh, gallery and the house gallery. Um, Statuary Hall has, um, you know, uh, Jefferson Davis and Robert E. Lee, uh, it's about, and, and there is a tradition of reconsidering them. Yeah. Ronald Reagan recently replaced a man named Thomas Starr King because people no longer knew who he was, another Californian. And um, Florida is finally replacing its uh, statue of a Confederate general that has been there for many, many years with Mary McLeod Bethune. 
the, uh, the, the great educator and activist and I guess den mother of the black cabinet during the New Deal in World War II, really overdue for, for Mrs. Bethune. And she's also got a statue in Washington. Okay. We're going to change course now because okay. you have a new book coming out uh, that is very timely. It's called The Presidents Versus the Press, The Endless Battle Between the White House and the Media from the Founding Fathers to Fake News. From day one of the Trump administration, it seems that he and the press have been at odds in a very dramatic way. Um, is this kind, this level of animus between the president and the press unprecedented? So I think it's, it's noisier than ever, for sure. It's uglier than ever. But as I try to show in my book, it's, it's, it's traditional. And I, I start my book with George Washington uh, slamming a newspaper onto the floor and jumping up and down on it with his boots, um, which sort of is, sets the tone for the way presidents have treated the press. They have tended not to be chummy with them, to be outraged at criticism, to crack down on the press. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I, you know, from, from John Adams to Lincoln to FDR, to Barack Obama, they have tried to work around the press by creating their own media outlets, their own, their own uh, avenues to speak to the public. And they have pushed really hard against journalists. By comparison, Donald Trump's bark is much worse than his bite. He may want to put journalists in jail, but Abraham Lincoln did put journalists in jail. Um, he may want to put them on trial, but John Adams really did put them on trial. So, you know, again, long tradition and Trump never stops talking about it, but he's sort of benign in a certain way. George Washington came to the presidency. He was a, a national hero. Uh, the, the general who had overcome terrible hardships to defeat the British, a man of impeccable integrity and, and dignity, although maybe he chopped down that cherry tree, we don't know. But, um, <laughs> One would think that in the eyes of the press, he could do no wrong. But was that not true? Well, it was true for three years. Unfortunately, he had five more years to go. Um, in the middle of his term, his own Secretary of State, Thomas Jefferson, from within Washington's cabinet, sort of said, you know, all of the newspapers are praising the Federalist Party and Federalist policies, and they're kind of pro-British, and they're they're, they're not too respectful of states' rights. So Jefferson organized the creation of a pro-Republican newspaper. In those days, Democratic Republican was the opposition and, and organized it in the city of Philadelphia, which was the capital. And he even got a job for its editor in the State Department so he would have a subvention and make it financially possible for him to create a paper. That paper began attacking George Washington. Jefferson didn't think there was anything wrong with that, but Washington did. And his last four years particularly, when yet another opposition paper was created in Philadelphia by Benjamin Franklin's grandson of all people, just mercilessly attacked him as a royalist, as a, a pompous uh, leader, and then questioned his loyalty, his patriotism, his work ethic, his integrity in terms of finances. And they hounded him all the way back to Mount Vernon and made his second term a misery. Um, and I think this new idea of press criticism was so distressful to him, uh, stressful and distressful, that that's why he didn't run for a third term, even though many people wanted him to. Now, I. John Adams, I would have expected to have a difficult relationship with the right. press because he had a difficult relationship with everybody. Yes. Um, but Jefferson was a great champion of freedom of the press, but even he um, had problems with the press when they were writing about him. You know, I don't want to trivialize Jefferson's, you know, slave ownership and his, um, you know, his basically immoral um, seduction of a, of a teenager who he owned, Sally Hemings. That's really big stuff in moral terms. But you could draw a parallel between his attitude, his liberal, his liberal writings and his attitudes towards slavery and his liberal writings about free press and his attitude. Because he spoke a good game, 
and he left us great ideals to aspire to, but he absolutely hated the Federalist Press. And while he didn't want there to be a federal uh, law that made it illegal to criticize presidents, which John Adams signed and enforced, that was only because Jefferson didn't believe in federal authority. He was fine with state libel action uh, in the state courts to repress journalistic criticism. Uh, so he was fascinated by the press. He said he believed in a free press, but he hated the editors who criticized him as passionately as Adams and Washington did. Now, there were some presidents that the press helped to bring down. Um, you mentioned, uh, I think, John Adams. Who else? Uh, well, Washington, in a way, if you think he would have served almost right. for life. And uh, certainly Nixon. Nixon, obviously. Certainly Nixon. But before Nixon, there was FDR. Um, he had a really interesting relationship with the press. He, he did 998 off-the-record news conferences a two a week for 12 years. He, they, they loved him, even though they got a little cranky at the end of you know, 11 years, 12 years, as one would expect. But they really liked him. Their publishers didn't. Their publishers never endorsed him. But they had an unwritten rule never to photograph him in a wheelchair to conceal the true nature of his disability. If one of their colleagues tried to take a picture of him, when he was being lifted into his automobile, someone would knock the camera away. I mean, they, they were on his side. And this, even though he went around them to master the radio and, and produce these fireside chats that electrified the country and brought him into people's parlors and living rooms. So um, that's the kind of president that the press supported. Obviously, Jackson had terrible enemies in the press. Uh, Lincoln did as well, but Lincoln put them in jail. His administration jailed nearly 300 Democratic newspapers during the Civil War, arguing that their anti-war editorials were uh, seditious and uh, unpatriotic. That's an argument that we're still having about the legality of that action. And of course, the famous case, as you mentioned, is Nixon. But um, I would think that I, JFK was the did the press love him? I mean, it seemed that they did. Yeah, uh, there's an exact um, analog to FDR, I think. A, they masked his illnesses. They certainly masked his private life, which is something they did not, this kind of scrutiny, they did not spare Bill Clinton from at all. But they did not, they knew about JFK's affairs and they wrote nothing about it. They knew, uh, I think many of them knew that he had serious medical problems, took a lot of drugs. They didn't discuss that. And he also, like FDR, went around them. He, his televised news conferences were not meant just to keep the press informed. They were meant to entertain the country. They became must-see television for people uh, uh, a couple of hundred times. And so JFK also was very angry about press coverage of the Bay of Pigs, wanted the coverage of the Cuban Missile Crisis to be in his favor, ostracized newspapers he didn't like, newspaper men, canceled subscriptions to the Herald Tribune when it criticized him. So he, you know, he had it both ways and he may have been the last president to have it both ways with the press. Yeah. Now, the, at least the liberal press has gone after Trump ferociously, but he seems to be in a lot of ways immune to their, you know, to their criticism. What's going on there? One reason is I think that uh, around the era of Bill Clinton, the press became hyper-partisan as it had been in the 19th century. Uh, uh, TV coverage is obviously either liberal or conservative. And you, you tend to watch where you're in your own comfort zone, MSNBC or or Fox or their various, you know, close relatives and, um, you know, Breitbart or, or CNN. So there's, there's no neutral zone for the press anymore. Uh, and um, therefore every criticism of Trump comes to people who are already convinced that he deserves criticism. And it's when, when someone like Chris Wallace challenges Donald Trump, it makes international news because he's going against the grain. And at the same time, and I do credit Trump with, with one accomplishment for sure, 
in the manner of Roosevelt with radio, in the manner of uh, Kennedy with television, and in the manner of Barack Obama, who used the White House website uh, and the early days of the internet to go around the press and create his own message. And I'd like to get back to Obama in a minute because I was very surprised when I did my research on Obama. Trump just uses Twitter. He is his own megaphone. He doesn't need the press. And what I criticize the press for, and not Trump at this moment, is that the press covers his Twitter feeds or tweets, not to be redundant, as if they're the AP wire. Anything he says from his bed at six in the morning becomes the story for the rest of the day. And I think that the press has given up its leadership on news coverage in a way that even Roosevelt uh, uh, did not compel the press to do. We've only got that. about a minute left. So what do you want to see going forward in terms of how the press um, covers the presidency? I want them to reestablish their toughness. I certainly want them to ask tougher questions at these daily briefings, which have morphed into uh, political rallies. And I want both sides to continue the, the, the healthy face-off. Barack Obama, who was not too friendly to the press, believed that the press made the president better by its scrutiny. And the president made the press better by, uh, by giving them opportunities to question him. We've lost that and we need to get it back uh, in the next four years, whoever the president is. Okay, um, some interesting stuff in your book. Um, I'm, af I'm afraid we're out of time. I want to thank Harold Hoser, director of Hunter College's Roosevelt House Public Policy Institute and author of The Presidents Versus the Press for joining me today. His book, which is published by Dutton, an imprint of Penguin Random House, is available in bookstores and online. For the City University of New York and One to One, I'm Cheryl McCarthy. <laughs>